In this video, we're going to cover basically three different things. The first one is what specifically is an inborn error of metabolism? The second one is how common are they? And the third one is how are inborn errors of metabolism actually inherited? In the next video, we'll go over clinical signs and symptoms as well as different treatments. So let's start. What is an inborn error of metabolism? Well, it's exactly what it sounds like. So inborn means that the baby is born with it. It is part of the baby's genes. So it is actually a genetic disease. And so once you're born with it, it can't be fixed or cured. You're just hoping to live with it where there is few consequences as possible from the disease. An error, as you all know, means that something isn't functioning properly. Normally, this is because there is an enzyme in one of the metabolic pathways that isn't functioning properly or that enzyme is lacking altogether. It could also be the failure of functioning of a coenzyme or a cofactor which helps that enzyme work or it could be because the transporter which basically takes different substrates from one side of a cell to the other or from outside or inside the organelle to the other side is also not functioning. And metabolism, because all of these pathways are involved with how the cell gets its energy and how it performs all the functions that it needs for the body to actually survive. Inborn errors of metabolism are a huge and varied group of diseases that can be inherited or can occur as a result of a spontaneous mutation. And we'll talk about that more in a bit. These diseases involve the failure of the metabolic pathways that are involved with either breaking down or storing different nutritional compounds. So basically breaking down or storing fats, sugars, proteins, and various other chemical compounds. This sounds really complicated, but at its roots, it's actually very logical. As you all know, our cells need a steady supply of energy. And the vast majority of the time, this comes from glucose. Fatty acids can also be used as energy, but the vast majority of the time, it's glucose. So if there isn't any glucose readily available, then the body will break down stored components into glucose so that it can be used. As you know, the three main macronutrients are fat, glucose, and protein. Protein is generally used to build our bodies, whether it's hormones or enzymes or different structural components. But if we're running really low on sugar or if we've consumed too much protein, then the body also breaks down the protein. Fats are also structural components of essential compounds in the body or they can be broken down for energy. And of course, the carbohydrates that we consume are broken down to glucose. If we don't use the glucose, then that glucose is built up into glycogen and stored in the liver and in muscles. So when we need glucose, if we don't have enough, the glycogen is broken back down to glucose. Ultimately, the glucose, if you remember this word, goes through the Krebs cycle to actually give us the energy that we need. Now, just imagine, that each one of these steps of breaking down the larger molecules or building up the molecules so that they can be stored involves hundreds, if not thousands of enzymatic reactions. Some of these reactions will happen just in the cell. Some will happen in mitochondria. Some will happen in peroxisomes. Some need to be transported across different membranes so that the reactions can occur. So if there's anything wrong in any one of these enzymes or coenzymes or transporting proteins, then the whole chain will break down. So two bad things could happen as a result of this. The first one is because the chain is broken, then often the baby won't get the end product that it needs. And a lot of the time that end product is glucose. So let's say that an infant has kind of gone longer between feeds and has run out of readily available glucose. So the body has to break something else down. Normally, the first thing is glycogen. But let's say the baby has a glycogen storage disease. Then the baby won't be able to break down that glycogen to give the baby the glucose and the baby will have hypoglycemia. Same thing if the baby has a fatty acid oxygenation defect. 
So if a baby is lacking an enzyme somewhere in the pathway to break down that fatty acid, then it's not going to end up giving the baby the energy that it needs. And as you all know, that can be lethal. And we'll come back to this later, but that's why in a lot of these diseases, part of the treatment is making sure that the baby is fed regularly. So we're not dependent on the body breaking down other substrates to try to give the baby energy. And the second big, maybe even bigger problem with having a dysfunctional enzyme is that all the products before that enzyme are going to build up and the body has no proper way of being able to get rid of them. As you can imagine, a lot of these metabolites that should be broken down can be super toxic when they build up in really high quantities because the body isn't ready for them to be built up in high quantities. And depending on where that enzyme is broken down or where that substrate is actually stored, then that is going to be the organ that is damaged most if there's a problem. So for example, glycogen storage disease. The glycogen is mostly stored in the liver. So if there's an, a problem with those enzymes, then one of the main problems is with the baby's liver. So another example is very long chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. This enzyme catalyzes the initial steps of beta oxygenation of fatty acids. So basically breaking down fatty acids in the mitochondria. And this is essential for energy in both cardiac and skeletal muscles. So if they lack this enzyme, then previous metabolites end up building up in cardiac muscle and end up with a really bad cardiomyopathy in babies with this deficiency. So with this disease, if you make it through the bouts of hypoglycemia because you don't have the energy production, then you'll end up with a severe cardiomyopathy if this disease hasn't been adequately treated. And we'll talk more about these weird symptoms in the next video. So to reiterate, because you know I love doing that, now you have a general idea about what causes inborn errors in metabolism. Basically, it's when the body has a problem breaking down a substance within the body. This basically results in not enough energy for the body or a buildup of unwanted metabolites or substances, or it could be both. But just now, I really just emphasize the protein, the fat, and the carbohydrate metabolism. Honestly, there are many substances that are combinations of these different macronutrients, and there could be errors in breaking down the combinations of those different macronutrients. The International Classification of Inherited Metabolic Disorders, or ICIMD, includes 1,450 disorders so far, obviously they're always adding to them, divided in 24 categories comprising currently 124 groups. As an aside, this group prefers the phrase inherited metabolic disorder as opposed to inborn error of metabolism. And honestly, that might be the direction that we're all moving in, inherited metabolic disorder. They don't really like the word error, which is fair enough. And they also just really want to emphasize that these are genetic or actually inherited. These categories include disorders of mitochondrial metabolism, nucleotide metabolism, vitamin and cofactor metabolism, trace elements, neurotransmitters. And if you're interested in all of these, we've put the reference down below. I just want to go over a couple more kind of weird examples because they may be clinically relevant or much more likely you may be asked about them in exams. So the first thing is, in addition to abnormalities in metabolism of the macronutrients, there might also be errors of metabolism in trace elements. For example, copper is a really important cofactor for loads of different enzymes. Both Wilson's disease as well as Menke's are both inborn errors of metabolism related to abnormal copper metabolism. Or, for example, glucose and proteins are sometimes combined together in the body to form substances called glycosaminoglycans, or GAGs, G-A-G-S. You've all heard of these. Examples include hyaluronic acid and chondroitin sulfate. And in the body, they act as kind of shock absorbers and lubricants pretty much everywhere, especially in the skin and in the bones. 
But everything could be fine and dandy with the enzyme to actually make these gags. But what about when the body wants to actually break them down to replace them? Like everything in the body needs to be replaced. Well, if there's a problem with the enzyme breaking them down, then again, we have an inborn error of metabolism. Well, there is a huge group of inborn errors of metabolism called mucopolysaccharidosis. Look, I've filmed this about three times now. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that word. I've read it maybe a thousand times, but you know the word I'm talking about, mucopolysaccharidosis. The enzymes should be in the lysosome, but the enzymes are lacking. So you end up with an inborn error in metabolism, and this type of disease is called a lysosomal disease. Examples of this are Hunter's syndrome or Hurler's syndrome. See, I told you you've heard about these on your exams. The other slightly tangential thing that I want to emphasize here is all the different types of inborn errors in metabolism that can be related to protein breakdown. And why I want to go over this is it really kind of used to confuse me. I think what's so confusing is that there are so many different types of amino acids and they all go down slightly different pathways to be metabolized which is kind of different from fatty acids and glucose, which pretty much have pretty similar breakdown pathways. And on top of that, about at least nine of the amino acids are essential, and the body uses these essential amino acids to make the other non-essential amino acids that the body needs. For example, phenylalanine, which is a essential amino acid, is converted to tyrosine in the body. If the body lacks that enzyme, then tyrosine won't be made and there will be buildup of the phenylalanine and other different metabolites as the body tries to get rid of it. A lot of these specific metabolites are actually very damaging to the body and this baby or this person is diagnosed with phenylketonuria or PKU, which I'm sure you've heard of from the newborn screen. So PKU is an example of an error in protein metabolism. And there are other errors like this, for example, errors in breaking down the branch chain amino acids. And you've heard of other examples of these too. For example, maple syrup urine disease is a problem with breakdown of protein. So is isovaleric acidemia, which I'm sure you've heard the other name, sweaty feet syndrome. All of these, including PKU, are problems with breaking down specific amino acids. So that's one huge group of inborn errors of metabolism related to protein. That's the first one. So that's where there are issues breaking down individual amino acids, maple syrup, urine disease, PKU, etc. Like we already talked about though, protein can also be broken down to be used for energy. But before that protein molecule can be kind of shuffled through to get the energy, it has to be deaminated. So the amino part of the group needs to be removed. In the process of removing that amino group, ammonia is produced. Ammonia is toxic to the body. So the body funnels the ammonia through the urea cycle. You've all heard that term funnels it through the urea cycle and gets rid of the urea in the urine. So if one of the enzymes in the urea cycle is not working, then we have a urea cycle defect and we have a buildup of an ammonia level. So again, this is another type of inborn error of metabolism related to protein metabolism. And then there's another third huge category in errors in protein breakdown and that is the organic acidemias. And I don't know why this always confused me that I'd always kind of not put it together that it was protein. Organic acidemias are an issue with protein metabolism. Further down from breaking down the branched amino acids, another set of enzymes is responsible for breaking down the substrate more so that it could then be funneled into the Krebs cycle. By the way, the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle, and the TCA or tricarboxylic cycle are all the same thing. It's the cycle that's responsible for taking the acetate and funneling it through the cycle so that acetate comes from the fats and the proteins that cycles it through the cycle so that you can get the energy that you need. Yes, I did have to look all of this up. 
So before even reaching this cycle though, if the enzymes are missing of breaking down these kind of branch chain fatty acids, then that's when we end up with the organic acidemias. So methylmalonic acidemia and propionic acidemia. These are actually pretty common. So these are pretty important for you to remember. So to reiterate again, there can be three different types of inborn error of metabolism related to proteins. So the first one is the individual amino acidopathy, so like PKU. The second one is urea cycle defects, like OTC, we'll talk about that later. And the third one is the organic acidemias, like methylmalonic acidemia. Remember these broad categories. Let's move on to number two. How common are inborn errors of metabolism? In Fanaroff and Martin's Bible of neonatology, which is perinatal and neonatal medicine, the chapter on metabolic diseases is written by Dr. Arthur Zinn, who is a metabolic specialist. He starts the chapters brilliantly by going over some of the misconceptions that clinicians have about inborn errors in metabolism. And the first misconception that he talks about is that we all assume that inborn errors of metabolism are actually really rare when they're not. He writes that yes, individually, each inborn error of metabolism is actually really rare. So PKU, for example, has an incidence of one in like seven to 10,000. Homocystinuria is one in 200,000. But because there are so many different types of inborn errors of metabolism, if you add them all up as a group, they actually end up being pretty common, probably somewhere around one in 2000. The great thing is, is that so many countries now actually perform newborn screens. And we'll talk a lot more about newborn screens in the second video. But because we have the newborn screens, we have a much better idea about how many of these babies end up with these diseases. A recent study done in China that was published this year in 2023 examined all the newborn screen results in eastern coastal areas of the Chinese coast they found that the overall incidence of an inborn error of metabolism was one in 2,600. The most common individual IEM was PKU, which was about one in 7,000. And the second most common was methylmalonic acidemia, which if you remember is also an issue with protein metabolism, which was about one in 27,000. Massive studies in the US have shown that the rates are pretty similar. About one in about 3,200 infants have issues with inborn errors of metabolism. So just stop for a second and think about all the other really rare stuff that we see in the NICU all the time. Like the incidence of a CDH, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, is about one in 2,500. So think about how many of those that you've seen. So now you can imagine that we are definitely seeing a lot more inborn errors of metabolism, whether we are actually recognizing them or not. If you work in the NICU long enough, you're definitely gonna see a PKU and a methylmalonic acidemia. And number three, how are the inborn errors of metabolism inherited? Well, as we keep saying, they're all genetic issues, which means that the gene coding for the enzyme or the cofactor or the transporter is either missing or that there's something wrong with that gene, it's dysfunctional. The vast majority of IEMs are autosomal recessive to the point that if you get this question on your exam, how is this disease inherited? Just go ahead and put autosomal recessive. I know you all know this, but just as a quick reminder, if a baby ends up with an autosomal recessive disease, then it means that both parents were carriers of that disease and they both, and the baby inherited both their abnormal alleles. So basically there's a one in four chance of a baby getting that disease if both parents are carriers. So you can imagine in places with high consanguinity where lots of relatives are kind of getting married or whether it's close or distant relatives getting married and having babies and basically you have a pretty closed gene pool, then you have a much higher chance of having inborn errors in metabolism. But it's not really that straightforward anyway though and there are some slightly confusing aspects to this. For example, some of these mutations aren't really actually inherited from the parents, but rather it's just a spontaneous mutation that happened in the fertilized egg as it was dividing. So just a mistake that happened as the gene was duplicating and not inherited from the parents at all. The second confusing thing is that even if the parents are both carriers of inborn error of metabolism, 
are the same in one area of metabolism, then usually when that baby presents, it is the first baby in the entire family to actually have the disease. This sounds not very logical, but especially now as families aren't having multiple kids, and really, as we said, there's only a one in four chance of a baby getting the disease if both parents are carriers. So actually, statistically speaking, if parents have two kids, then the chance of both of them having the inborn error of metabolism is only 6%. And to make it even more confusing, some of these IEMs are inherited in an X-linked manner. So remember, X-linked diseases are going to be expressed in males. So males get really sick from them. Women or females are generally just carriers. The disease tested the most, which is X-linked inheritance, is OTC deficiency, which is a urea cycle defect or ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. Others include X-linked protoporphyria, where patients get a horrible sensitivity to the sun, Menke syndrome, which we mentioned earlier, a neurodegenerative disease of copper metabolism, and Fabry disease, which is a lysosomal storage disease, so basically kind of breakdown of the gags, and X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy. So these are kind of like the most common X-linked inborn er errors of metabolism. The last type of inheritance I want to mention is kind of weird and that is a mitochondrial inheritance as you all know the mitochondria are the battery of the cells i don't know why everybody remembers this even my very very non-sciencey older brother when he's trying to sign sciencey will randomly send me that in a text the mitochondria are the battery of the cells. Anyway, normally the mother's egg carries all the mitochondria that will end up in the baby. The sperm uses the mitochondria that was in its tail to actually reach the egg, but by the time it reaches the egg, none of the mitochondria of the sperm get to go inside the newly fertilized egg. Some of the proteins in the mitochondria are coded for by genes that are only found in the mitochondria. Other proteins are coded for by genes that are found in the nucleus. So obviously the sperm will have those. But for genes that are only found in the mitochondria for the mitochondrial proteins, then those will only come from the mummies. So if the mummies have an abnormality in those genes, then the baby will as well. So in this case, Mitochondrial inheritance is actually only inheritance from the mother. Very, very odd type of inheritance and unbelievably rare diseases. Examples of mitochondrial disease and therefore this weird inheritance is MELAS, M-E-L-A-S, which stands for mitochondrial encephalomyopathy, lactic acid and stroke-like episodes. And another one is MERF, M-E-R-R-F, which stands for myoclonic epilepsy with ragged red fibers. Um, and there are other loads of really sad diseases which basically involve progressive neurological deterioration. Be aware of these for exams and also just to understand that often there are other types of inheritance that we aren't even necessarily considering. Okay, that was our introductory lecture on IEM. Now go and watch the next lecture on how to diagnose and treat inborn errors of metabolism. Once again, if you did learn anything from this video at all, then please press the like button. And if you're interested in any further neonatal education, then subscribe to the channel. If you do write to us, and we love it when you write to us, then please let us know where you're from. Thank you so much for being here.